Hey there, YouTube. Petey Two Finger jumping on the Gibson video bandwagon. I woke up today and I saw, oh my goodness, it happened. I made a video about a week ago called State of the Guitar Address. So I guess we'll call this State of the Guitar Address Part 2. Gibson, what went wrong? So uh, I'm not so much going to uh, rail on Gibson in this video. Uh, as I am going to try to shed some light on what went wrong. I went and read some articles online today, in pr print articles, and I grabbed some quotes which I thought were relevant. So forgive me as I read this information and regurgitate it to you. I haven't memorized this yet. Um, and I just pr primarily, I ought to say, like last week when I made that video, I just didn't really have the time to deal with Gibson because uh, I... I touched on it, but I knew I was going to be making this video, and then I woke up today and it was like, oh my goodness, everybody's already made their videos, they made this announcement yesterday, and I missed it, so, yeah, I knew it was coming, as you would with any big company, and like, I'm waiting for the X to drop, or not, with Toys R Us, I don't want to see Toys R Us go under, who hasn't, like, been out on a Wednesday night, you go out and grab some fast food, and then head over to the Toys R Us, to walk around and look at what's what they've got, what the kids are going to be getting for Christmas this year. I mean, that's fun. I I have more fun just walking around and looking at the stuff in the packages than I would if I actually bought the toys for my kids. So I don't want to. I definitely don't want to see Toys R Us go under. Gibson. I think what will happen is they're going to get rescued out of this somehow. You know, there's rumors that Joe Bonamassa who has an incredible collection, uh, like a virtual museum. Uh, Nerdland, I think he calls it, Geekland, something like that, where he lives, his home is just jam-packed. He, Joe grew up, his folks, his dad was a guy that traveled around the Midwest, all over the country, and collected old guitar amps and uh, guitars and musical equipment and resold that stuff. So Joe is a wonder kind, I would call him. He was kind of born for this. And that would explain whether you like Joe or not. I know there's a lot of people that hate on Joe. He certainly has his own style, and he, he certainly knows what he's talking about. So I would be thrilled to see someone like Joe Bonamassa. I heard there was a rock star that was going to, uh, step in and help Gibson out. There's rumors that that was one of the rumors that I heard today, and I immediately thought of Slash. Uh, but as we all know, he Slash wasn't even using real Gibsons when he recorded uh, uh, whatever that first album was that made them so famous. So, yeah, three minutes in. There are a lot of reasons why Gibson's brand has been tarnished recently, but the Krupps of the crux of the blowback is an alleged dip in quality control. And that could not be overstated. A shining of this example was over the summer when Gibson unveiled the 2017 Les Paul Standard with a photo that showed an obvious ding in the $4,799 guitar's finish. Now, I remember when they released the guitar, this may have been a separate incident, but it, it's the joke was Gibson is now releasing guitars with pre-cracked headstocks. Now, the headstock on a Gibson sits at a little bit of an angle, and they tend to crack. And Fender guitars have a bolt-on neck where you pull four bolts out of them, and you can put another neck in if you have a problem. But Fender necks don't really seem to crack because they're not angled. So it's just kind of crazy. Gibsons are glued in, and they're much more difficult. You have to take it to a pro luthier, like a guitar doctor, and they, like, steam the neck out of it. And it's a whole huge expensive pain in the neck if you crack the neck on the guitar. You're almost better off just buying a new guitar. So, uh, and that's the thing. These guitars are, like, when you find one that's perfect for you, they're, it's really, they're, each one is different. And Gibson established itself as the uh, handmade, fine quality instrument that you would save many months of your salary, you would save to be able to buy, purchase this lifetime instrument where Fender guitars are the everyman guitar and they were like, 
Leo Fender was kind of like the Henry Ford of guitars, where he figured out how to make an assembly line and slap them together cheaply, but make a good product. And some would say, if you get a good Fender, it rivals a good Gibson. It'll give it a run for his money. Boy, I'll tell you what, I started out playing as, uh, a Les Paul copy. Uh, it was a Memphis Japanese early 80s, and that was a beautiful guitar, but it suffered from the crack neck. It had a hairline fracture on the on the in here, uh, just coming out of the body, coming out of the neck pocket. And uh, someone picked up the guitar by a strap, and it came out of the strap. There was no strap lock on it, and it fell down and put a crack up the guitar. So, anyway, that sucked. But, yeah, getting back to the point. Gibson, you know, they, they started out as this, like, handmade fine quality instrument, and as time went by, they changed hands. They got in trouble in, like, 1986, and they sold the company. And since then, the quality control has... It's not a dip in quality control. It's it's non-existent. Um, it says here Gibson faces two um, two main problems. Number one, their employees hate them, and number two, their customers think that they're crap. So, Mastodon guitarist Bill Kelleher revealed why he stopped working with Gibson and instead jumped ship to ESP just like Metallica frontman James Hetfield before him. So this Bill Kelleher guy, he uh, was getting free guitars from Gibson, and he said, I don't want them chambered, and they would chamber the guitars, <laughs> which is a lot of work. You have to, like, remove, you have to put cha remove wood to make these chambers to make them lighter. And he was like, I don't want them chambered, which would mean less work. And so they were just dropping the ball, and, like, he would say, like, certain specifications, and they wouldn't do it. They would just give him whatever. So there was, the the company was mismanaged. The employees were miserable. There was no morale, and that comes down to this horrible CEO, Henry Juskowitz, and he's the guy that came in when they sold the company, when they were in trouble in uh, mid-1980s, 86. Gibson was sold. And here is a quote. The CEO is horrible in all capital letters. <laughs> mean, nasty, uber controlling. The employee wrote to Gawker, if anyone in the company dares to have a different idea than his, you could pretty much guarantee that they will be fired on the spot. So, we, uh, like I said, I was telling you how I started out with this Gibson copy, and I was daydreaming that when I would become an adult, I would save up my money and get some really nice Gibson guitars. And then as I matured and I got older, it dawned on me one day, hmm, every guitar player that really knocks my socks off has always played a Fender Strat. They all did, all my, like, really favorite guys, Yngwie Malmsteen, Jimi Hendrix, uh, David Gilmore, Adrian Ballou, you know, all Strat guys. And when I tried a Strat and I felt how it felt uh, on my body when I held it, it was just like I had arrived and that that was it. You know, I didn't want that Gibson anymore very quickly. And then as time passed and I started paying attention, and one of the things I noticed, and this is getting personal, and I don't want to offend any of the Gibson people that are out there, but I've run into a certain type of guitar player that's awful. They're awful guitar players. They have no business with anything that has strings on it, especially with a plug that goes to an amplification device. Like, no, keep them away. And those type of guys, there's a certain type of like really poor guitar player that should not have a guitar. And those guys think that if they have a Gibson, then they're going to, like, the problem is that they have a, you know, that they have a Fender, a Squire, or like a, a, a clone of the Gibson Les Paul. They don't have the real thing. Like, they have an Epiphone. And ooh, it's, you know, that's the reason I stink is because I don't have the Gibson. 
if I get that Gibson. And those guys, they're the most annoying people. They know about the gear, too. They'll talk your ear off, and they'll, they're the guys that go to Guitar Center, and they don't tell their wife, and they get credit cards and do all this stuff and end up getting in debt. So you can find deals on stuff like that from those type of guys. But they're those, type, those are the type of guys that will go and get... Uh, fake decal badges and sand the stuff off and refinish it and put Gibson on it and try to sell unsuspecting people and, you know, run up the price eight times of what it's worth. You know, those are the type, those guys, not good, not good. And as I mentioned, paying attention over the years, because I do from time to time visit Guitar Center and say, I mean, just to look at the quality of what they have. And what always blew me away was how high they used to put the Gibsons up so high so you wouldn't see all the flaws in the finish. Because they weren't even sanding them. Any of the cheaper Gibsons that were like under a grand, they, they were like, it looked like they didn't even sand them. Like the wood was all prickly and like there would be all these design flaws and just horrible stuff. My kid became a music person when she was around 13 or 14. She fell in love with the Beatles. And then she ended up going through a Led Zeppelin phase, and she, of course, wanted a Les Paul. And because I got her a Fender. And she was like, I asked her about it. She said, yeah, I really do want a Gibson, a Les Paul. You know, this is because she loved Jimmy Page. And I said, well, I hate to tell you, but you, you have to spend, like, a quarter of your life salary to get one that's any good. Like, they're they're incredibly horrible. And... She didn't want to hear it, so one night I took her down. We went to uh, both Guitar Center and Sam Mitchell. We couldn't believe it. Like I said, I, I could not believe it. For $3,500, you could get a decent Gibson, and then they had like a 799 Epiphone that was way better with the fit and finish than this $3,500 uh, Les Paul. It was junk. I mean, well, I, I don't want to say that it was junk, but... There was a $149 ESP LTD guitar, a Les Paul, that was better than the $3,500 Gibson. It just was. I mean, it didn't look as cool, like it didn't have a sunburst or anything, but it was it was a finer instrument. If you if you had to play it blind, blindfolded, you would have definitely preferred that. And that's the thing is, people aren't going to keep continuing to pay for a name badge. I mean, you know. The cat's out of the bag with the internet and review videos and forums. You can't f be fooling people anymore. You know, people are, they're not that dumb. So, shame on you, Henry Jiskowitz, this horrible CEO, this Mastodon guitar player, they couldn't take care of him, and then James Hetfield. <laughs> I mean, whether you like Metallica or not, here is a guy that's doing this for a living, and he is so filthy rich, he terminates his give me your free, you know, wipe me relationship that he has with Gibson because they're, they're that horrible. And he went with ESP. So Gibson Brands, the iconic guitar company based in Nashville, filed for bankruptcy protection on Tuesday after years of financial turmoil after a failed attempt at evolving into a musical lifestyle company. The company, which filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in Delaware, has struck a deal with the majority of its creditors that will allow its business to continue and its instrument manufacturing to carry on. So I am foreseeing a buyout. Somebody's going to come in and rescue this company. They're going to sell off a lot of the other companies that Gibson picked up along the way that were a mistake. And hopefully if the person, the CEO, knows anything about guitars, they can turn this company around. Because, uh, And I'll tell you what, what they need to do to get the customers back is just offer quality you just you can't rape pre people on on the pricing you have to offer quality all the way down the line even to your lesser expensive guitars even if you have to take a little bit of a hit in the beginning on that you're going to have to do that to show that you're back all of the stuff that gibson did that was just like pissing in the mouth of the consumer that the neon uh line of les paul's the robot where you had to get all of the guitars that they put out, the Les Pauls, had robot tuners on them. I heard a story of a guy who was in a touring band, like a real deal band, and he went to hit an A at the after the intro, 
and uh, the thing put itself in tuning mode as he hit the. <laughs> so all six strings dropped down, uh, you know, ten full steps, and then pulled themselves back into tune. When he <laughs> can you imagine what that sounded like through a bunch of stacks? So yeah, uh, this company they come out with the uh, the they had a horrible, hideous the Flying V, Gibson Flying V two that they came out with, that was a copy of the uh, the Schecter uh, Area fifty one I think it was, unbelievable, horrible, hideous guitar. So yeah, uh, <laughs> experts say the bankruptcy foreshadows the departure of Henry Jeskowitz, who, along with partner Dave Berryman, rescued Gibson from bankruptcy collapse 32 years ago and returned the company to prominence. Well, I don't know about that. Gibson makes guitars, banjos, mandolins, and its sub subsidiary Baldwin, Baldwin is a popular piano maker. As more popular music has been made with computers, international sales began to slip creating a challenge that large manufacturers and retailers like Gibson. In response, Juskowitz oversaw an aggressive strategy that expanded Gibson from a guitar company into a lifestyle brand. The company acquired an electronics company that made headphones, speakers, and turntables. As Gibson took on more debt to acquire Philips, Ankyo, and other electronics companies, its annual revenue grew as its profit margins shrunk. Gibson also owns and makes instruments under brand names such as Epiphone, Kramer, Maestro, Steinberger, Tobias, along with ownership of historical brands such as Kalamazoo, Dobro, Slingerland, Valley Arts, Baldwin, Chickering, Hamilton, and Wurlitzer. Although it's well known for its guitars, Gibson's largest business has been shifted towards a lifestyle brand of electronics. Gibson's offer, Gibson offers consumer audio equipment devices through its subsidiaries. Gibson Innovations, which is the Philips brand, Ankyo Corporation, Ankyo and Pioneer, TAC, TAC and Esoteric brands, which were like home stereo and uh, cassette tape. TAC was good stuff. Sherwin Vega, which is speakers, and Stanton. Stanton is home audio, I believe, as well as well as professional audio equipment from KRK Systems and also TAC and Tascam. So their expansion to a lifestyle brand was a mistake. This was what went wrong with Gibson. They did not, they forgot about where they came from. They forgot, they didn't just forget, they pissed in the mouth of their consumers, jacking up the prices of these ridiculous or any other Japanese import brand that you would get for 150 bucks off the shelf. Well, I think that was a used price on that LTD I was talking about. But So let's say $300 new versus a $3,500, and the $300 one blows its doors off. You know, at some point, it's that name that's on the headstock that people are paying for over so many years if you keep just giving the middle finger to your the people, your consumers, your fan base, they're going to forget about you. They're gonna switch over like me, like I did. They're gonna buy. They're gonna pick up a Strat for once and go. Let me see what that feels like. You know, this thing's thirty five hundred dollars. The last one that I got, I paid eight for, and the neck cracked. So, am I gonna buy the thirty five hundred dollar one and have that neck crack too, or let me hold that Fender Strat and see what that feels like? And then they're gonna go whoa, <laughs> and then they're gonna plug it in, and they're gonna go wow, this really sounds good. Especially, you know, if you have an ear for that type of stuff and you can hear the difference between single coils and humbuckers. It's a huge difference. And then they're, you know, like running a single coil through a fuzz and then now they're making super strats where they have coil tapping and so you can get the benefits of the Gibson, which to me that was the only benefit was that it came with humbuckers, you know. And that's if you want that, because I really love single coils. I, I, ideally, I like to have both. So there are a lot of reasons Gibson's brand has been tarnished lately. I already read that, didn't I? Yeah, so, excuse me on that. 
going back to this point that as popular as more popular music has been made with computers, that's talking about hip hop taking over and the musical landscape shifting. And with that, all I have to say, I don't mean to sound like an angry old man shaking my fist, but with hip hop, all it takes is a computer and a high speed internet connection to be able to illegally download a loop CD and then have a guy who you need a guy who's savvy enough like a geek guy to be able to figure out how to do that how to go on like uTorrent and steal whatever has been pirated and then put together loops where you're dragging in little chunks of audio to make beats and when you put that up against making traditional music like something what Frank Zappa did where you're scoring an orchestra or even playing guitar there there's not there's not much to that so th the the pendulum is going to swing back away from hip hop. Hip hop is here to stay, but guitar is going, going to go in and out of style. Guitar is here to stay too, so you're going to see more hip hop styling, uh, more music where the rhythm section sounds hip hop and the guitars. It's going to have rock and roll guitar in it. You're going to see more of that blending of those two styles as time passes. Because I got news for you: you can't blame Gibson's problems on hip hop being popular. That's just a cop-out. What happened with Gibson was they got too big for their britches, and they focused on turning it, in, trying, turning it into running the world with Gibson being a brand, which is just absolutely silly. When I started to see those chunky little box Bluetooth speakers at the Apple store that had the Gibson knobs on them, and they looked like a Marshall, or the Marshall knobs on them, and they looked like a... a Marshall, it's got a gold panel, and it's a little Bluetooth speaker. You saw those at the Apple store, and you think, oh, what is that, something from guitar, for a guitar? And I went in there, and it's this, I don't know who makes it, but it's in the iStore, and it looks like a Marshall, and it's got two three-and-a-half-inch drivers in it, and it's Bluetooth, and it's $399 for this thing because it looks like a Marshall. That's the type of stuff you can get away with that. You know, you could put it in your store and everyone can pick it up and look at it but the amount of people that are going to buy it and you can't run a company that sells stuff like that and that's what Gibson did they had their premium guitar which just completely outpriced of the normal person and then the lower end stuff was just junk so that's where they went wrong they got too big for their britches they forgot what that name on the headstock meant was quality handmade an instrument that will last you, last you a lifetime and they had Epiphone as their redheaded stepchild. They should have really just had all the junky stuff be Epiphone and then really done well with the Gibson. But even in the lower price point models, you need to maintain some kind of quality control. And so they didn't do any of that. And then they overexpanded their business and they were waiting on this big financial return. And it never happened because they, because the CEO, he didn't, this Henry Jeskowitz didn't realize you have to have good morale. You can't run around just screaming at everybody. <laughs> this is what happens when you treat people like dirt. They turn on you. So it's it's a sad day if you're a guitar player. This isn't a good day. It's never good when there's uh, stuff like this that happens. But you never know. This could be a great day. This could be the beginning of turning around this great American franchise and bringing it back to closer to something what it originally was. Rumors are that there's a big name rock star who's interested in purchasing Gibson. I initially thought of Slash for some reason, thought he would have enough money to do that. And then uh, I read that it's Joe Bonamassa. Now, love, love him or hate him, I know there's he's a real decisive, he's a polarizing person. And a lot of people hate Joe, but you kind of, when you look into him and you see that he really can play and he has his own style. And his story is, his dad owned a music store and they traveled all around the country and his dad brought him with him everywhere when he was growing up as a kid. And his dad's thing was finding old Gibsons and Fenders up in people's attics and old tube amps and then cleaning those up and restoring them and selling them. So Joe, he knows what he's talking about. And even if you hate the guy, you can't deny that he knows a lot more than you or me combined about this stuff. It would be, he, he would be ideal type of person to step in. So let's 
let's hope, let's pray that the right thing happens for Gibson because I really don't want to see this company that has been so maligned just go the way of the dodo. That would be bad, wouldn't it? So, and like I said, I would be the first person to try to do everything I can to support Gibson in any small way I could, but I can't spend my money on something that's junk. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm the type of guy that buys stuff secondhand anyway, so my opinion doesn't really count. So, thank you for joining me, PD Two Finger. What went wrong, Gibson? What went wrong? It's not my fault. 